planned or not, but if not, I'll just have to use my teacher voice, I suppose. I suppose. Amen. We uh, are excited to be here this evening. It's been a long day. Uh, but God is good. And I have found out that when there is lots of opposition, that's when the Lord really blesses you. And we have had that trying to get to this point today, for sure. But God is faithful. Amen. I know we need to pick up on last week's uh, handout, I think, at around verse 14 and 15. I apologize for my tardiness, but I've had multiple students that I've invited to come to our church, and they're coming. But nobody was out there to greet them. <laughs> so I had to be out there and, and greet them and, and uh, let them know that we were glad that they were coming. And, and uh, church, that's what we're supposed to be about. So pray for our youth ministers that are out there this evening, Minister Smith and uh, uh, Sister Latanya and others who may come. Sister Cassie is held up at the hospital, so we had to make some uh, adjustments, but God is still good. God is Amen. faithful. Mm -hmm. Sister Sabrina, in my haste, I think I've given you my handout as well, so I'll probably <laughs> need one um, as we go through this. If you have last week's handout... Verse 12, chapter 18 of in the book of Acts. Let's go to God in prayer. Fathers, once again we come before you this evening and we are coming as humbly as we know how. You know the day that we all have had. Yes. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes. Lord, I thank you this evening that you are a gracious God. I thank you that you meet us right where we are. I thank you, Lord, that you uh, teach us and help us through your word. And Lord, that's what we seek tonight. We seek to know what your word is saying. We seek to know what you would have us to know that we may tell others, Lord, we seek to be uh, uh, in counsel with you, Lord, that you're, you speak to our hearts, God. Speak to our minds and help us to uh, grow as a church, grow as people, uh, grow as Christians that are making an impact, Lord. And if we are not making an impact, impress upon us, Lord, that we need to be in these last and evil and weary days. Lord, the days wear on us, but yet we are thankful for your uh, power that replenishes, that strengthens, Lord, that gives us courage and hope in the time of need. I thank you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, bless this lesson, we pray. Amen. 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 Chapter 18 of the book of Acts this evening, beginning at verse 12. Amen. As we come to these verses, we are reminded of what God had spoken to, uh, what Paul had been encouraged by the Lord speaking in verses 9 and 10 and some of you all were looking at it last week when you I spoke to you that there had been uh, several visions several visions that had come uh, to Paul and if I'm not mistaken this is the third 
of six visions that came or six words from the Lord, so to speak. Uh, the first one was on the Damascus uh, Highway. Um, the Lord spoke to Paul. And then the second one, if I remember giving you that scripture correctly, it was in Acts, the oh, 16th chapter, that is correct. And then now this one in the 18th chapter. And the Lord speaks to Paul and tells him what? Do not be afraid, uh, but speak and hold not thy peace. So what God is saying to him is this. Speak boldly for me. Don't be afraid of what people will say or how they will react, but speak boldly for me. I think that is a message that we need to hear uh, this evening. I think that is a message that we need to know about this evening. We need to know that it is time for us to be bold. It is time for us to be uh, uh, ones that are not squeamish about what the Lord is, is telling us to say. And we're not standoffish and, and, and we're not uh, in a huddle in a building. And I heard a person say uh, this past weekend, and really I tried to save what they said on my, um, on my phone just as a reminder to me. And it said that if your Christianity is to the point that you are just good enough with getting a few downloads and staying in the corner of your house or your church or wherever and not impacting the world, then you might want to consider which Christ you are serving. I'm going to say that one more time. If your Christianity has you to the point, your religion, that you're just good enough to stay to yourself, then it does not match up with what Acts is showing us. They literally risk their lives for the gospel. They put themselves out for the sake of the gospel. They put themselves in harm's way for the sake of the gospel. And here Paul is going through a moment that many times some of us, we can go through. Am I doing the right thing? Am I, I just feel, I just want to go somewhere and be done. <laughs> I'm through with it. You ever been there? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Uh, and the Lord says in a vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. Amen. It's something about the Lord being inside of you that sometimes you just can't hold your peace. Amen. You want to tell somebody the good news. And then he says, for I am with you and no man shall set on thee uh, to hurt thee for I have much people in this city. So God not only tells him that I'm with you, but there are others that are not afraid to speak out. You ever been in a group and you had something you need to say, and you just waited for somebody else to say it, then you jumped on the train with them? <laughs> maybe you, maybe even you repeated what they had said. Y'all seen those shows? It's kind of like a Andy Griffin, Barney Fife moment, where Andy speaks up because Andy is Andy, and then Barney jumps on and acts like he said it. <laughs> My point is this. Sometimes it's good to have people that speak the same thing you do. And believe in the same Christ that you believe in. And are bold just like you are. And then it helps you. But sometimes you're going to have to realize. You may be standing by yourself. Depending on where you are. I would hope and pray that inside of the church. You would not. Amen. With these who are we are with in the body of Christ. You would not be by yourself. But we don't know. Amen. Let us be bold. Let us be encouraged by what the Lord spoke to Paul. So it, it helped Paul. And he continued there to the point, I think I mentioned this last week, of a year and six months. It, it sustained him, teaching the word of God among them. But it was not without opposition. We must keep that in mind. Amen. And I will go back to a question that I asked you all 
over a year or more ago. Told you this, this gentleman approached me at the most inopportune time. And he said, what are you doing to prepare your church for the coming persecution? Strange question. At a strange place for that question. And it made me feel strange. Mm. Yet, it's not too strange. Uh, we must realize the early church went through it. And I believe the church of the living God in the latter times will experience that same thing. It is even at the door. Be, be mindful of that. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection, that's persecution, with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, the Bema seat, if you will, uh, referring to the seat on which the authority figure sat. And this brings to mind scripture that Paul uh, tells the Corinthians later that all believers will stand before the Bema seat of Christ and that will judge our works or our reward. So this seat that Paul speaks of later to the Corinthians church, actually here in Acts, it was a seat that the proconsul or the, the head of that area sat on to judge matters. When Christ will sit on it, he will judge Christians for the works that they have done in their bodies. So uh, the good news, if, if connecting that with Corinthians, is we won't be judged because of our sins. Amen? Amen? But we will be judged according to our works. Alright? Uh, what we have done with what the Lord has given us after we are saved. Alright? Second, check that out at some point. Second Corinthians 5.10. This seat here mentioned is an earthly seat that Corinth would be familiar with. So, they bring Paul before this seat. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, amen, God literally does what he just promised Paul in verses 9 and 10. What did he say? Don't be afraid to speak and hold not thy peace. Verse 14, just when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio, un unlikely source, uh, said unto the Jews that were accusing Paul, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason with that I should bear with you. All right? But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look you into it, and I will be no judge of such matters. So what, is, what has happened here? Gallio has cut them all off. He said, you're coming here with a matter that, that is a religious matter that's among you. Why are you bringing this matter to me? I don't have anything to do with it. And then know what it ha no, notice what happens. And he drave them or drove them out from the judgment. See, he got them out from in front of him. Then all the Greeks took Sophonies, uh, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. God defended Paul through an unlikely source. Amen. Do y'all believe God will keep his word? Amen. 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 So just when Paul was about, he, he's used to it by now. Think about what's happened in the previous 17 chapters, or at least the previous eight chapters uh, with Paul. He's getting ready to defend himself in court. They done drug me through here again. I've been thrown in jail. I've been beaten. I've been left for dead. He's about ready to open up his mouth. And Gallio speaks. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe it was just because Gallio uh, was led to speak. I believe God used him mm -hmm. to speak on behalf, not so much for Paul, but just the fact that you, you've thrown this out here, and really it's not a matter I need to look into. That's, that's who, you, who you call God and in your religion. Notice Judaism and Christianity were, were kind of close. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying, that's something between you all that you need to handle. Why bring this matter before me? And those Jews got mad about the trap that they had set. And the Greeks and all took this man, Sosthenes, and beat him before the judgment seat. Your notes say, be wary of the trap you set for somebody else. Amen. Amen. It could easily become your trap. Now... I don't really and shouldn't have to say that to save folks, 
So I'm just saying it overall. <laughs> but be mindful of that, amen, that sometimes the barb, the hook, the trap, the snare you set for somebody else trying to set them up, it can backfire, yeah. especially if that person is representing the Lord and they are standing for the Lord and they have not done anything but do what he's told them to do. And that's why we need to be mindful of little tip-ups and puff-ups and, and stir-ups in the church because that does not honor God and God will have the final say over it. Amen. Amen. Sosthenes, that's a rough name to say became the victim of the Greeks' anti-Jewish feelings. And if this is the same Sosthenes mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1 and 1, evidently this beating got him straight. <laughs> Amen. I, I won't go into that, but I had a... I'm looking at some in there. <laughs> oh, Lord. I've had a few in my lifetime. Get me straight. Amen. My mom got me straight most often. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All righty. Well, Sosthenes, if this is the same one, and no, no joking matter, he got saved. Amen. If not, I wonder what happened to this one here. All right. Any questions from the end of last week's lesson? All right. Then, if no, let's dive into... Uh, Verse 18 from this week. So we are going to uh, phase into the end of Paul's uh, second missionary journey into the beginning of his third missionary journey. All right? So verse 18 reads, And Paul, after this, tarried there a good while. And then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. So now there are his hookups from last lesson. Divine intersection with those two. All right. Having shaved or shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. And when he came to Ephesus, he left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry a longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God wills. And he sailed from Ephesus. All right? So let's just look at those first several verses there. As you look and see, it, it said that he shaved his head. Now, some people have mistaken that for, for him doing something that was bad. Uh, yet, the way that I read it and the way that most authors or, or theologians will see, he was grateful uh, for God's providential care over his life. He was grateful. And so, therefore, he used this as a sign and a reason to show his devotion to God. All right? Uh, some people also equate this with, uh, y'all remember this famous character? Samson. Um, and the Nazarite vow. One of that, the part of that was the fact that there shall be no razor that comes upon their head. And obviously when Delilah shaved all his luscious locks off, he lost his strength until the Lord gave it back to him. Uh, but they took that vow not to shave. However, this is a different way that Paul is kind of viewing it. Another thing that in that verse uh, comes to me, and I mentioned it uh, briefly at the beginning, is the fact that Aquila and Priscilla going with Paul meant that there was, where they were leaving from, where they had met up, there was enough ministry and leaders in the area they were leaving to keep that church going. So they're leaving Corinth and they're headed. And that's a very important point. We have to realize the early church, these churches are setting up. They're fledgling, some of them. But they have to put strong leaders in place so that these church continue to run. If you'll, if you'll read a lot of Paul's letters, his letters had to address issues that had cropped up in the church or the various churches 
that needed to be addressed. He couldn't jump on a plane and fly there. He couldn't jump on a, in the car and fly there and get there in, in no time. He had to send his thoughts by letter. So many times churches uh, uh, communicated through letters. And we see here as they leave, evidently there must be enough leadership in the Corinthian church that they feel comfortable going with Paul. Now, what is that point for us? We have to have leaders in the church. Amen. We have to have leaders in ministry and in the auxiliaries and in the committees and in the various aspects that support the goal and the mission of the church. That's important. The pastor is the, the under shepherd of the church, but there must be those who come and bear up arms as leaders in the church. There is a hierarchy. There is a, a, a level that comes along with that. And people must step forward and help lead. Amen. It generally gets really quiet when we say that. Like right about now. Amen. But if the church is going to continue to grow, you'll see it in scripture. You will see it uh, uh, bear out in, in other aspects. There must be leaders that support uh, the mission of the church, support the pastor. Amen. I think one of our faults as churches over the last 50, 60 years is we depend too many, too many times just on one single or two or three people, and there is not enough uh, of a push from all of the church uh, that, that creates an impact. Uh, I may be wrong, but I've grown up in the church and I've seen that. You've, maybe you've heard somebody say this phrase, only 10% of the people do the work. 10 to 20. 80-20 rule. 80 20 rule, somebody said. Yeah. So we have to have that. Notice Aquila and Priscilla go with Paul. So whoever was left behind surely was able to be functional. And keep in mind, Corinth was corrupt. So they had to trust those who were left behind. Don't miss that point. Verse 19 note says, as he reasoned, this was what? Paul's custom. Correct. He goes in and he reasons and he uh, uh, talks with those in the synagogue. Now, one more time, if you remember from last week's lesson, the Jews represented his greatest opposition. In fact, to the point that he kind of threw in the towel on them. All right. But yet they were the greatest opposition. When they desired him to stay, he tarried no longer, but then he left and bade them farewell. Now, Luke, the writer of this book of Acts, does not mention it in detail, but obviously when he says, I'm going to the feast, and notice it says, I, uh, I'm going, or he's going up, it says that in some translations, going up, uh, yeah, verse 22, when he had gone up and saluted the church, Jerusalem was elevated among the other areas in that particular part of the world. So it doesn't technically say he did go there, although he said the feast is coming in Jerusalem. We have to assume that that is where he went. All right, so he went back to where the beginning of the church started. And this ended his second missionary journey. Now, what does he do once he gets to uh, verse 23? Let's start at 22, and then we'll get into the meat of this. And when he had landed at Caesarea, we heard that Sunday. <laughs> Wasn't that an interesting? The coast of Caesarea Philippi and the background. On the, anybody do any homework on that after Sunday evening's sermon? Go dig into what all went on in Caesarea Philippi and Jesus, why he took his disciples there. So that area, when he had gone to Caesarea and gone up he saluted the church and he went down to Antioch so evidently he had to be at Jerusalem and then Antioch was the center uh, the new center of, of where the church was the Christian church was and the, the leaders of that particular church then verse 23 says and after he had spent some time there he departed and went over all the country 
of Galatia and Phrygia in order to strengthen the disciples. So, what does that speak to us? His goal of this missionary journey and what he has been doing is to strengthen other Christians. Amen. So let, let's not overlook that. Let's not overlook that. The goal of the church is to, yes, give out the gospel, to preach the gospel, to minister the gospel to the lost in our world. Worshiping our Savior and Lord, that is to God. Evangelizing the lost world, that is outward. But there are also times when we've got to minister to one another. Amen. We have to look into one another. We've got to see about one another. We've got to strengthen each other. Anybody in here say they get strength from coming to church? You should. You should want to be around other like-minded believers. You should want to be here where people are and get strength from those who are here. I get strength. I need it. I need people to pray for me. I need to be propped up. So he went about strengthening all of the disciples. So not only did Paul uh, minister to those who were around uh, that were lost, he also strengthened the disciples. Why? We get weak. We need help. We need the brethren to, and the sistren for that matter, to help us out. I cannot tell you how many times that I have come to church even before I was a pastor and uh, something that happened in a testimony or a, a, uh, a song or whatever it was strengthened me. I didn't expect it. I didn't know they were going to do that. And they didn't even know they did it for me. But it happened for me. It strengthened me. Yes, sir. Uh, before you get off of 22, I, I just want I, something always I was, didn't quite understand. Sure. Uh, it gives, it says he, when he landed in Caesarea, it says he went up to greet the church. Mm -hmm. And then it says he goes down. Antioch. Yeah. Which, I mean, if you look at the map, geographically, Antioch is north. I mean, is I think they mean altitude wise. Elevation. Mm -hmm. Topographical. That's the way, when I studied in on that, I thought that myself. Yeah. That because, if you remember, if, if you remember, Jerusalem is, it was elevated. Yeah. And to get up to it, I think you had to climb in. I think. Take just a minute. Uh, go to Psalms. I may be chasing a rabbit here, but hopefully I'm not. We can come back to it. No, 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 no. That's fine. That was a question I had. Uh, and I heard somebody explain. These are called, I think if you look at them, if I'm not mistaken, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and then Psalm 24 are sometimes called Psalms, I think it maybe is 24, is the Psalm of Ascension, that they would uh, sing as they went up to the holy city, okay? And then I think that's why they get to the last part and says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. I believe that one is called a psalm of ascension. Uh, and so Jerusalem literally was elevated above the surrounding areas. And then Antioch, geographically, I, I know the, the direction part, but I guess altitude-wise was lower than Jerusalem. That that's an interesting. I, I just thought he was. I thought maybe they was trying to say something there that I wasn't getting. Because, yes. I mean, all those directions there landed. And yeah. Then, and then they went up, and then they went down. 
I just thought maybe there was something in there that yeah. you're trying to convey. But that is one of those deals. That is one of those deals, Deacon. When that's one of those deals where we, I often used to wonder why they put all these maps in the back of the Bible. Yeah. Well, we did a few years ago. We talked about, and I remember the notes were on the the screen here. That when you when you study God's word, and I never really got into it like that until I kind of started studying deeper. And I guess that's how God grows you. I know it is, but you study God's word historically. You study God's word uh, through literature, or lit literally, I guess, through the, the grammatical part of it. And then this is an ex example of where you study it geographically. Uh, to back up what I just said, I, until this past Sunday, had never heard the background of Caesarea Philippi. Now, I can't go into it on camera. I explained it in detail uh, talking to my better half back there, and she was like, really? Wow. Yuck. Their worship of that God, that where we get the word pandemonium from, had something to do with the, that area, and it was a bad area. It was, it was pretty, pretty interesting. So the, the point from Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, and I assume this is the same area here, is, you know, you just read it sometimes and say, well, Jesus came to a new area. But if you look at it and get the background, was there a reason he took his disciples to one of the most lewd places to tell them, I'm starting my church through you, and the very gates of hell that you see right down, by the way, geographically, that's what that place was named, the gates of hell, which is completely interesting. The very gates of hell will not prevail against her. So once again, when you study God's word, you not only look at the grammar. Uh, somebody said the other day, just one period was Pastor Armstrong. One period can change the whole one thing. And that's why the, the God, God's uh, word also says until not one jot or tittle will pass away. Amen. Not one brush stroke as they wrote it out mm -hmm. unless it be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, that's a great question. We have to look at the geography behind it. So. He's in this area. He's gone up, and then he goes down to Antioch, and then into verse 23 quickly. And it says, And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia. So if you study that, you can say, Well, why there? What, what's in Galatia? Well, obviously, that's going to be where the church at, in Galatians is, is uh, a part of. And Phrygia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew... Named Apollos. Now we're introduced to him. Born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. All right. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Now get this, underline this, knowing only the baptism of John. So, whoa, what, does that, what in the world does that mean? Well, it, it's kind of like, uh, kind of like the phrase from the movie when you watch some of these Star Wars movies. He, they always talk about your training is not complete. Your training is not complete. Well, technically, his training, so to speak, was not complete. His uh, experience ended with, evidently, he was taught by a disciple of John the Baptist. So he did not know some staples of the faith that had come to pass after John the Baptist. But yet, what does the scripture say about him? He was fervent in the spirit. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He taught diligently and he was mighty in the scriptures. Y'all see all that? He was mighty in the scriptures. He was taught in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in the spirit. Yet his instruction stopped with John the Baptist. All right. So verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard. They took him unto them. And expounded unto him. Catch this. 
the way of God more perfectly. What a beautiful passage. Now here is when I start to say, okay, God, you're sovereign. You brought Paul into an area. Y'all catch this? You allowed Aquila and Priscilla to be run out of their home so that they can make a divine connection with Paul. And then when the work was done or the work was, was to a point in Corinth, they left from that area, and now here they are with another divine intersection with a young man here with a, a person, Apollos, that they are going to be able to impact. We can't underestimate who God brings into our vicinity. All right? So let's dig into this. Look at what your handout says. Apollos was eloquent in speech. And he was very knowledgeable in the Old Testament scriptures. Because keep in mind, technically, John the Baptist was, was the last Old Testament prophet. Jesus, I, I, he's the prophet overall. But John the Baptist, he was an Old Testament prophet. And he was predicted, preparing the way of the Lord, making the crooked paths straight. All right? He announced, he was the announcer of who Christ would be. So he was an Old Testament saint, this Apollos, because he had been trained in the way of the Lord. That's what that means. And he followed the teaching and whatever John the Baptist's disciple had given him. That's all he knew. Now, have we kind of run into that before? Yeah. Remember Cornelius? He's not quite like Apollos, but... He was a fervently religious man, but he didn't know the Jesus of the Bible yet. Mm -hmm. Amen. Remember, who was it, Lydia? Same thing. So as these people run into these various ones, they are uh, their lives are changed because God allowed their paths to cross. Now, let's connect the dots. Y'all still with me? Say amen. amen. That's why we have to go outward. Amen. Amen. Maybe there's somebody out there that has read their Bible and has met the Lord, but they just don't know some of the other things that they need to be doing. Right. Mm -hmm. We can't always judge a book by the cover. Amen. I'm going to say some things here, and, and I pray that you pray that you agree with me. But just because somebody does not come to church does not always mean they're not saved. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Now, just because somebody has this going on or that going on does not mean they're not in the Lord. There are some things that happen that, that there are some sticky situations that can happen. Yet, God can cause your paths to cross to help them get on the right track. Now, I don't believe Apollos was in, in sin. I don't believe he, now obviously if he's human, he had a sin nature, but it looks like he was doing what he was supposed to do. Yet, he needed a divine meeting with Aquila and Priscilla. Amen. All right? Look, let, let's back to Apollos for a minute. He was spirit-filled which interpreted means he was boiling hot. <laughs> we want some services with some folks in it like that. Amen. Amen. Come on, y'all. Yeah. Come on, y'all. He was, he was on fire for the Lord. Yeah. No. But he didn't quite know all of the, the end of the story. Right. All right? Let it be said of us that we are mighty in the scriptures and fervent in the spirit. So this makes an interesting point that the part of Apollos' message was lacking since he had no knowledge of how baptism fit the Christian faith. All right? So he had no knowledge of the truths of the significance of Christ's death. Think, think about it. He's kind of real, still back at John the Baptist. A lot of stuff had happened since John the Baptist. Jesus died. And then he, most importantly, he rose again. And then he commissioned 
the disciples and the, the, the followers that he had to wait in the... Wait for and wait in the upper room for the promise of thank you the Holy Spirit so there's three major things right there he's missing Jesus died y'all still with me he rose and then you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit alright so makes an interesting point his message was powerful, yet it was lacking the full punch. Mm. So backtrack for a second. What about those people out there that, that maybe they met the Lord. They, they heard the gospel. They got down on their knees and they asked Jesus to save them. And based on his word, he has done that, yet they don't know where to go to next. Could it be? That God has ordered your steps to cross paths with them. Not just the lost, but the religious unsure. Amen. Can I tell you something tonight? I'm not omnipresent. Nor would I want to be. I can't be in everywhere at one time. But church can cover ground when we all have this mindset that, you know what? When I go to the store today, God may call someone to cross my path. Holy Spirit, help me to be ready to say exactly what they need to hear, nothing more, nothing less. And you thought you was just there to get some wings for next week's dinner. Some mac and cheese and, and some detergent and bleach. And you went down the aisle where the rich crackers were. And God has an assignment for you. If you're ready. If you're back it up, Paul. If you're bold enough. And don't do one of these numbers. Hello. Apollos' message was lacking. Apollos accepted that message. And notice this. Here it is. This is the beauty part of it. it. It says he's fervent. He's mighty in the scriptures. He didn't say, you can't tell me anything. They literally took him under their wing. And look what the word. I, I love what it says. It says that they, uh, uh, they took him unto them. I have that underlined. And expounded. Unto him. Now, even more of a beauty to this is the fact that this is a husband and wife team. Mm -hmm. Missionaries, husband and wife. That's a beautiful thing. All right? They expounded the way of God more perfect to him. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Who, when he was come, helped them much, which he had believed through grace. Lord have mercy. I, I don't know if I'm doing this justice or not, but as I see the, these paths crossing, how Paul and Aquila and Priscilla came together, now they have come together. Paul is off in the synagogue, but here's P P Aquila and Priscilla. Now they're helping Apollos, who God has prepared for them. Now Apollos is moving out, and they send letters saying, This brother's the real deal. We got him straight. He's good to go. And he preaches and helps and expounds the scripture and others are raised up. That is how the church is supposed to work. Amen. Amen. In fact, there should be more folks saved outside of the church than inside. Amen. We, thank you Pastor Freeman, we come and we huddle and get receive strength to go out. Yeah. Amen. You get in a huddle, you call the play. Then you go out and execute it. Like you know you've already won the game. I'm going to go back for just a second. When I used to play football, when I used to be able to play football, the games, Brother Deacon, amen, were fun 
when you had a 30 point lead and you were still in and you knew you already had won and you could go out and execute sometimes without all that extra pressure. It was even more fun and that team was demoralized. Does the scripture say we've already won? Yeah. Yeah. Sure does. Read the end of the book. We win in Christ. We are victorious. We're supposed to go out and execute the playbook Jesus left us. Acts 1 and 8. Ye shall be my witnesses as you go. Paulus said, I know about what John and his disciples, the disciple John had taught me, but now I know the end of the story, so to speak. I know that Jesus whom John preached about and taught about. He rose from the dead. Amen. After training from Aquila and Priscilla, he became an even more powerful Christian. Now, we're going to take a detour for just a moment and deal with this. This husband and wife team completed his training. Hence, we see the providential connecting of Paul to Aquila and Priscilla. And Apollos' aid and training was to come. He, we'll speak more about him later. As I was reading about him, it said he was such a powerful debater that he crushed any of the Jewish arguments against the gospel. He was powerful. So evidently he was some orator that was able to literally, as they came up with their arguments, crush it right there on the spot. That's what was said of him. Now, if you look at verse 26, sometimes, and I read this a couple places, sometimes people will take this passage, and this is why I must study Scripture carefully. Thank you again for bringing that up. To take this passage and make it look like that Priscilla and Aquila were co-pastors of certain places. I want to say this, and say it in the most nicest way possible, but if you watch today, there are more folks clamoring for position in the body of Christ, calling these new titles out. and all. So there's titles out there. I don't even know what in the world they mean. Amen. What happened to just serving? Amen. And they're trying to have titles that are above this and that and this and that. And sometimes people will take scripture and twist it. This scripture here is not an argument. For the fact that Aquila and Priscilla were pastor and co-pastor. Amen? Amen. All right. Why is that? Paul will later go on to write that in, in the body of Christ, he does not suffer a woman to usurp the authority of a man. All right? And that is in terms of leadership. And we talked about at that beginning the hierarchy of the church. Now, that is not saying that women cannot teach. Y'all catch that, didn't you? Amen. I, the women's class out here, I'm envious of. <laughs> yeah, they didn't give no shout out or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they pack it out. Right. And they got rotational teachers and everything. And every time I go through there, they're, they're, they're just having the best time. And I'm like, I want to go in there and sit. <laughs> you, you have... There are so many opportunities to teach. He's just saying you can't be in the position of a pastor. And some folks don't agree with that. But let's look at this why. It is always Satan's intention to flip order. Did y'all hear me? Satan wants to flip order. So all you got to do is go back to Genesis, and this will explain what 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 and why, if someone said this about Aquila and Priscilla, they are in the wrong as well. We're not saying women are way down here. What we are saying is it is a partnership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. This marriage was a partnership that helped Apollos. But some people try to, to usurp and try to make something out of it. Well, look at what Satan does. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Y'all remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? Mm -hmm. Satan approached Eve. Satan in the form of the serpent. The serpent was a creature that man was supposed to have dominion over. Y'all remember that part? Amen. So the creature, which man was supposed to have dominion over, approached the woman. 
and beguiled her and tricked her. And the woman who is supposed to walk along beside the man, but the man has headship in the marriage, amen, and the woman is submissive to the man as they are partnering together, and they each are made to work together. But in this case, she gave the fruit to the man and kind of told him what to do. And if you read the text, man never said anything. Y'all catching where I am? And then when their eyes were opened, man thought, I can be like God. Are y'all catching that? The serpent <laughs> told the woman, and the woman gave it to the man, and the man said, well, God, you gave these, and they all tricked me, and I was going to be like you, and I'm, and I, who told you you were naked? And I'm, well, I'm naked. <laughs> Satan flipped it. But he didn't have to take a bite of that out. But he did. But he did. Right. He sure enough did, yeah. and that's why I'm sitting here with no hair. <laughs> Standing. Minus a few teeth. <laughs> and I'm hot tonight. Yeah. I don't know. It's hot in here. He flipped it. God told man. Notice, if the woman had have eaten it, and not the man, we'd be all right. Because yeah. God placed it on the man. Our blood, what we have, comes through Adam. Paul later says, all men sin through Adam, not Eve. Right. Right. Satan flipped that thing. He turned the order right, wrong side up. God, man, woman, dominion over creatures. Mm. And don't think for one minute that he doesn't try to do that still in subtle ways. In the house of God, in the home, in businesses. And once again, it is not something saying that women are way down here. Everybody God made, he has given them positions to hold. All right? Serving side by side, their bond of marriage became a blessed yoke of ministry. Now, you won't see why that's, a, that's why that's a detriment. Here's second part of that. Not only does Satan flip the order, but watch this. Marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. Amen. If you remember it, go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. When you get home and read it, it is a picture of Christ and his church. Yes. Christ has headship over the church. Marriage reflects that beautiful marriage. When we get to heaven, there will be a marriage feast of the Lamb. Amen. The church doesn't tell Christ, we have lordship over you. Amen. 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 It is a subtle plan of the enemy. To get the things that God placed in order out of order. Right. And to make them think he's still doing it. They're missing out. Mm -hmm. They're being wronged. You've been done wrong. <laughs> they shouldn't say that to you. If everybody would do as God prescribed it, it would be a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And those who seek to have their marriage as God pres pres prescribes it can say... You know what? God has blessed us. Amen. Sometimes, in going back to Apollos, notice this. It did not say in Scripture, and I'm going to reroute back to him for just a moment. It did not say in Scripture that Aquila and Priscilla rolled up in the synagogue, heard Apollos preaching mightily, and said, this brother's wrong. He's not telling all of it. And then called him out in front of the whole assembly. Or they lashed out at him, or they belittled him, or they embarrassed him. What does it say? They took him unto them and trained him and spoke with him and explained and expounded the scriptures and got him up to par. Sometimes that's all it takes. It takes a simple rerouting instead of erasing, completely tearing somebody down. Amen. Now, in 27 and 28, and when he was disposed to pass, we've already read that, uh, it says that he helped them much. 
which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. That word exhorting in a way uh, vigorously, he exhorted them. In the New Testament comes from the word that means to stretch. Praise God. So what is that saying? Apollos stretched the Jews. He came into contact to their intellectual limits and those who argued against the gospel. He crushed those arguments, but he also encouraged, just as Paul had done, he strengthened those as well that were in uh, the word of God. All right? And notice a letter is sent saying that this brother is legit. Praise the Lord. As I said at the beginning of the lesson and we're finished, that's how they communicated. I was reading in some history a while back uh, in some of the old associational books. You know, I didn't always appreciate them, uh, but they're almost, they're not, it's not pitiful, but it's just precious, I guess. You look at the, the letters that are sent back in the 40s and 50s in the Providence Association, there's tons of churches that are no longer here, but they would send their, you heard them say, they would send their letter. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it actually, some of the books, you have their, what their letter was. Mm -hmm. And their letter would close, we are sending a delegate, we are sending, uh, it was like $5 mm -hmm. in our re representation, and we are yet holding on. Mm -hmm. One said, we are yet convinced so in those days, everybody couldn't make it to the association. So they would send their letter of representation. And they would describe their present position as a church. We are still, one said, we are still standing on the promises. Amen. You know what? That's where we need to be today. We have more means now to reach out to folks than we've ever had. And sometimes I think we do less with more. Amen. You can text. You can message. You can air mail. You can email. You can air fry. You can... You can FaceTime, Skype, video chat, Zoom. Room. We can keep counting, can't we? There's an app for it all. And reach out to people. And connect with people. And make relationships with people. In here tonight, amen. Praise God. Don't know how it's going to be done. Don't know when it'll be done. But we're making connections. We're trying to reach the, the, the youth in our area. It starts with one. starts with two. Don't be just content with the three or four that come here. Because after a while, they may be gone. They may move away. Who's next? We, we have to penetrate the culture and not let the culture penetrate and dictate to us what it says. We stand on the word of God. We believe God's word. God's word says this. We're not budging. And we must tell others what it says. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Amen. 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 Tell as many people as you can. Amen. 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 PowerPoint. The entire book of Acts depicts the transition from Judaism to Christianity. As the gospel spread, those walls of partition and those barriers were torn down. It is not surprising, therefore, to find imperfect uh, forms of faith, like Apollos. He, he was not quite there, but they helped push him over the edge to the right. Amen. There are people out there that genuinely don't know. They are an Acts 2. They are an Acts 17 generation. They really they want to know, but they don't know how to know. You may run into, I say it every week, you may run into somebody like that this week. Be ready. Be ready to share with them. Yes, ma'am. Like sometimes I think that explains denominations and differences. 
sometimes you know people under they believe in Jesus and the death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection, but they have this just this other little thing that maybe they just don't know. And yes. It's caught up and hung up in a denominational difference, and it's really not. Mm -hmm. They are saved, and but yet there's these little things that kind of mm -hmm. separate, and that's why we're all in different churches and a little confused on some Amen. things. Amen. You heard, you heard Minister Smith's testimony. Yeah, Minister yeah, Smith. Right, yes. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Ask him about it. He he's a wonderful example of what he he shared that a couple weeks ago. Amen. Excellent point. Anybody else?